Horses and men <clears throat> of the Persian Gulf Service Command. We are very much honored this morning by having with us the Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy, the President of the United States. I seem to be, this moment, thoroughly equipped with the weapons of war. If you had said to me, or I had said to you, three years ago, that we would meet in Iran, we'd have said today that we were completely crazy. The first was to lay military plans for cooperation between the three nations looking toward the winning of the war just as fast as we possibly can. And I think we've made progress toward that end. The other purpose was to talk over world conditions after the war try to plan for a world for us and for our children when war would cease to be a necessity. We've made great progress on that also. But of course the first thing is to win the war. And I want to tell you that you, all of you, individually and collectively, are a part of that purpose.
the past year, within the past few weeks, history has been made. And it is far better history for the whole human race than any that we've known or even dared to hope for in these tragic times through which we pass. A great beginning was made in the Moscow conference last October by Mr. Molotov, Mr. Eden, and our own Mr. Howe. There and then the way was paved for the later meetings. At Cairo and Tehran, we devoted ourselves not only to military matters, we devoted ourselves also to consideration of the future, to plans for the kind of world which alone can justify all the sacrifices of this war. At Cairo, Prime Minister Churchill and I spent four days with the Generalissimo, Chiang Kai-shek. It was the first time that we'd had an opportunity to go over the complex situation in the Far East with him personally. We were able not only to settle upon definite military strategy, but also to discuss certain long-range principles which we believe can assure peace in the Far East for many generations to come. Those principles are as simple as they are fundamental. They involve the restoration of stolen property to its rightful owner and the recognition of the rights of millions of people in the Far East to build up their own forms of self-government without molestation. Essential to all peace and security in the Pacific and in the rest of the world is the permanent elimination of the Empire of Japan as a potential force of aggression. Never again must our soldiers and sailors and marines and other soldiers, sailors, and marines be compelled to fight from island to island as they are fighting so gallantly and so successfully today. Increasingly powerful forces are now hammering at the Japanese at many points over an enormous arc which curves down through the Pacific from the Aleutians to the jungles of Burma. Our own army and navy, our air forces, the Australian and New Zealander, the Dutch and the British land, air and sea forces are all forming a band of steel which is slowly but surely closing in on Japan. And on the mainland of Asia, under the Generalissimo's leadership, the Chinese ground and air forces, augmented by American air forces, are playing a vital part in starting the drive which will push the invaders into the sea. Following out the military decisions at Cairo, General Marshall has just flown around the world and has had conferences with General MacArthur and Admiral Nimitz, conferences which will spell plenty of bad news for the Japs in the not too far distant future. After the Cairo conference, Mr. Churchill and I went by airplane to Tehran. There, we met with Marshal Stalin. We talked with complete frankness on every conceivable subject connected with the winning of the war and the establishment of a durable peace after the war. Within three days, of intense and consistently amicable discussions, we agreed on every point concerned with the launching of a gigantic attack upon Germany. The Russian army will continue its stern offensive on Germany's Eastern Front. The Allied armies in Italy and Africa will bring relentless pressure on Germany from the south. And now the encirclement will be complete as great American and British forces 
attack from other points of the compass. The commander selected to lead the combined attack from these other points is General Dwight D. Eisenhower. His performances in Africa, in Sicily, and in Italy have been brilliant. He knows by practical, successful experience the way to coordinate air, sea, and land power. All of these will be under his control. Lieutenant General Carl Spatz will command the entire American strategic bombing force operating against Germany. During the last two days in Tehran, Marshal Stalin, Mr. Churchill, and I looked ahead, ahead to the days and months and years that will follow Germany's defeat. We were united in determination that Germany must be stripped of her military might and be given no opportunity within the foreseeable future to regain that might. The United Nations have no intention to enslave the German people. We wish them to have a normal chance to develop in peace as useful and respectable members of the European family. But we most certainly emphasize that word respectable, for we intend to rid them once and for all of Nazism and Prussian militarism and the fantastic and disastrous notion that they constitute the master race. In these conferences, we were concerned with basic principles, principles which involve the security and the welfare and the standard of living of human beings in countries large and small. To use an American and somewhat ungrammatical colloquialism, I may say that I got along fine with Marshal Stalin. He is a man who combines a tremendous, relentless determination with a stalwart good humor. I believe he is truly representative of the heart and soul of Russia. And I believe that we are going to get along very well with him and the Russian people very well indeed. Britain, Russia, China, and the United States and their allies represent more than three quarters of the total population of the Earth. As long as these four nations with great military power stick together in determination to keep the peace, there will be no possibility of an aggressor nation arising to start another world war. On the Sunday following his inauguration, the very next day, the president took his problem to the great counselor. He went to church and bowed his head in prayer as he had done on the morning of March 4th before proceeding to the Capitol to take the oath. And while we cannot know what Franklin D. Roosevelt confided to his God or asked of his God, we do know that the people felt an even greater reassurance in this simple act of devotion on the part of the man who had so thrilled and uplifted him. And then, without the loss of an hour, he called in his secretary of the treasury, William H. Wooded, and planned and executed those brilliant and decisive strokes by which the country's financial structure was preserved. By declaring a bank holiday, he halted the growing penny and provided a breathing spell in which to readjust credit and provide more currency. March the 9th was a notable day in our history, with Congress eagerly accepting the President's recommendation. 
By a vote of 73 to 7, the United States Senate hastened to pass the President's banking measure. It was the most emphatic vote of confidence which that body had given to the head of the nation in many a long year. In the House, the new speaker, white-haired Henry W. Rainey of Illinois, was at the throttle and running the legislative locomotive in the direction of his party leader, the President, was demanding it should go. Rainey knew it was no time for quibbling. Straight through, he drove the Roosevelt measure. Intense interest was shown in the House as the clerk read the President's great economy bill, which planned the saving of 500 million. And with the banking situation smoothing out, the President went on the air on the night of Sunday, March the 12th, and talked to the people in simple, friendly terms. The bank holiday, while resulting in many cases in great inconvenience, is affording us the opportunity to supply the currency necessary to meet the situation. No sound bank is a dollar worse off than it was when it closed its doors. It is possible, of course, in a very few places that when the banks resume, a very few people who have not recovered from their fear may again begin withdrawals. Let me make it clear that the banks will take care of all needs. And it is my belief that hoarding during the past week has become an exceedingly unfashionable pastime. After all, there is an element in the readjustment of our financial system that is more important than currency, more important than gold, and that is the confidence of the people themselves. Confidence and courage are the essentials of success in carrying out our plan. You people must have faith. You must not be stampeded by rumors or guesses. Let us unite in banishing fear. We have provided the machinery to restore our financial system, and it is up to you to support and make it work. It is your problem, my friends, no less than it is mine. Together, we cannot fail. An entirely new spirit came over the face of the government under the president's guidance. For the first time in history, the Treasury Department, under orders from Secretary Woodin, permitted pictures to be made of the processes of printing and engraving United States currency in the Bureau of Engraving and Printing in Washington. Why, it made the old-timers gasp they were so startled. Confident in their president, in his policies, people all over the country rushed back to replace the deposits as the closed banks reopened their doors. All over the land, business and trading felt the impetus of this new confidence and courage. The wheels began to turn again. There was a rush of trading in the great Chicago wheat pit. In the New York stock market, prices rose sharply. People began to buy it, and encouraging reports were heard on all sides about the upturn in business that had come at last. A memorable day, when at the president's behest, the Senate, in record time, voted for beer, and the end of the long drought was in sight. Elated but resolute, the president sat at his desk, facing one new problem after another. With the financial structure of the country strengthened and revitalized, with new impetus given to commerce and industry, his mind now turned to farmers in their play, to the truck farmers who raise our vegetables, to the big grain farmers who provide our bread, And his thoughts took in also the distressing situation of the sheep raisers of the West. And as to what could be done soundly and practically for those men whose flocks cover a thousand hills, a wealth of wool and of mutton, and no market worth the trouble of shipping. And as our president sat and thought at his desk, he visioned the troubles of the Western cattlemen, sons and descendants of the bold spirits who carved out the famous cattle trails of the Old West. And in his mind's eye, no doubt, he could see the great and useless herds of fine beef, for which also 
there was no price to bring joy to the heart of the cowman. Days passed swiftly in that historic month of March 1933 when so much was done and so much was planned. And this man of many burdens gave his whole mind and soul to pondering the swift and practical things. And to him came the great vision of relieving unemployment by a great reforestation project embracing 10 states to provide work for 250,000 men and to create new farms, new towns, new wealth for the people as a whole clearing and reinvigorating the forests of the land. Providing the building material which industry needed. Visioning the progress of timber from the new forests that are to arise to the mills of industry that will await them in the future. Forests that will not be robbed by haste and by greed. His rapid mind moved on to the 22nd of that historic march to another decisive stroke. At his desk in the White House, he signed the bill which kept one of the most important pledges of the Democratic platform, the pledge to give beer back to the people if the democracy came into power. There it was, the document which reversed the ironclad restrictions of 13 years. And immediately all over the country, the work of preparing to brew good beer was begun. The cobwebs of years of neglect were swept from bats. Armies of men were called to polish the brewing machinery, put the long neglected plants in perfect order for the rush of business that was certain to come. Another emphasis was given to business when the president put his name to the beer bill and made it law. They brushed the barrels and they brushed up the brewery horses. And even the horses felt the gay stimulus of the New Deal. And Broadway got lit up to celebrate. beer has had anything to do with it. Something fine has occurred in this great country. You can actually see people going to work. Factories which have been closed for months, for years in some cases, have called for men, have started the wheels to turning, and are resuming the long interrupted routine of production. America is catching its full stride. There is a new feeling of hope, of determination in the air. It is a new march of prosperity behind the country's militant leaders the fighting president.